Okay, so that's sort of a brief background of where I am and what I'm doing. And one of the things we're really focusing on right now, uh, because it happens on September 1st, changing it, is the Fair Labor Standards Act and how that, how that um, affects the hotel salary. So what I'm going to run through is what it is and what has changed with it. Uh, I'm going to then review postdoc salary, the sort of recommendations that have been the state that postdoc salaries are in now, because I think there's some nuances in there that have not been talked about a lot. Uh, I'm going to discuss basically institutions have two choices. They can either raise all the postdoc salary to the new minimum, or they can track people's hours and pay them over time. Uh, and I'm going to talk about those things, and I'm going to lay out the opinions, and maybe I'll convince you, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anyone is going to track hours. I don't think so. But we'll see. We'll see what, see if I can convince you. Uh, I'm going to put up some information about some institutions that so far have declared what they're doing. Um, and also I'm going to talk a little bit about some other work that is now very happily wed into this, something that I was working on earlier. Uh, with the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, trying to harmonize postdoc titles and make sure that postdocs are administered in a more streamlined way at institutions, um, which is you know, sort of done in a very uh, piecemeal kind of fashion right now. And it actually ties in perfectly with this. It will really help everyone out uh, in this situation to have postdocs more streamlined and more, more clearly visible at institutions. And through the way, uh, through the talk, I'll be pointing out resources. This talk is being recorded, so it will be uh, available after this. Uh, we're also going to put the slides up on MSI Research in our channel. And then there will be a section on our website where I'll try and pull the resources up. The Boston Post Office Association also has a really good list of resources. We'll link it to those two. But trying to update that and put as much info up, see what institutions are doing, to get updated so that postdocs know what's going on. <coughs> So the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, the, the key part of this is that sort of minimum wages and, and overtime pay. Uh, and the key part is that it guarantees the minimum wage and overtime pay at a rate of not less than one and one half times the employee's regular rate for a 40 hour work week. And in March 2014, President Obama issued a memorandum to Thomas Perez, Secretary of Labor. Um, mandating him to go forward and try and look at the Fair Labor Standards Act. It has not been updated, um, to the best of my knowledge, since 2004. So there were 12 years uh, of things to look at, and he wanted to mandate the Secretary of Labor to go forward and see sort of changes that need to be made, anything new in the workplace, um, and any updates that were necessary. So a year later, uh, they come back and they say, OK, we're going to propose some changes. Um, they were giving the state for uh, feedback in September 4th, 2015. The key part was that the current exemption salary, this is the minimum salary you had to be at to not be having to, to start overtime, was $23,660 per year. That was set in 2004. And so they were proposing with this new change of salary, $50,440. And then this would be updated every three years so they wouldn't have to repeat the program again. And they would see with inflation what changes need to be made. And uh, the president laid this out in a post here um, in Huffington Post. So moving on, then again, another year. So the, uh, after the close of comments on September 4th, I believe they received 270,000 comments. Um, the new ruling came out that the exemption salary was set at $47,476, which was seen as somewhat of a compromise to get enough of business on board that it wouldn't be fought. The date for implementation was set, uh, which people felt quite strict, um, on December 1st, 2016. Obviously, this makes a lot of sense because this will be before the end of the presidential uh, term. Uh, and so there's information up from the Department of Labor's website. About that. That's sort of the, the gross like, change of things over time. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about postdocs. And this is um, there's a sort of interesting story about um, the, the battle for postdocs to be included in this ruling. Because I've laid out here, there were 
very many um, higher ed organizations that push very hard for these changes not to go through and for post office to be exempted. So CUPA HR, which is the College of University Professional Association for Human Resources, deals with HR at a lot of these um, uh, institutions. They coordinated a letter with the Department of Labor, to the Department of Labor, with uh, 18 higher ed organizations. All got together, and I think here you know, slide uh, and on the webpage, um, the letter and the summary of what they were into. Uh, and you know, they were very publicly writing thought pieces about how this is too much for higher ed to cope with. This and change. The key points they were suggesting was that there needed to be a longer time to adjust to the changes. They proposed lower salary level options, and they gave three options here. The $29,172 was taking the $23,660 and just applying inflation to it, which we thought before. Uh, but they gave some other options. We'll notice that they're below the NIH uh, suggested minimum for the stuff. And also, they wanted to rephrase the language to make post office sense. Similarly, the Association of American Medical Colleges, they submitted a letter uh, supporting this. And they again called for a longer time to implement the change. Um, explicitly said a salary level was below the NIH postdoctoral level. And they said we want post office to be exempted because we want them to be like residents. They should be learned professionals. So that was a, there was a very concerted, uh, organized push from higher ed side. Uh, in terms of postdocs, postdocs pushing back, uh, a lot of postdocs submitted individual comments. Um, and there were sort of group letters going around. There was one that maybe some of you would have signed that uh, group at MIT set up uh, and sent in. Um, the sort of most organized effort, ironically, was uh, with unions. So uh, four unions got together who represent postdocs or higher ed employees. Uh, in April, a bunch of these higher ed organizations met with the Department of Labor and put their case. And so the unions got together and said, oh, actually, we, we disagree with some of the things they've said. So we want to also come and make our case. We did so. And then what happened, of course, was that postdocs were not exempted. And not only were postdocs not exempted, uh, I think the day after the Berlin came out, this blog post appeared with Francis Collins and the Secretary of Labor, Thomas Fred, uh, explicitly making the case that they sued postdocs and they were uh, supporting postdocs in, in not being exempted. Uh, and uh, the NIH said we were going to modify the NRSA stipend level uh, accordingly to do it. This is very interesting that the, um, the postdocs were not exempted. I, I was quite surprised, pleasantly surprised. So there were no new exemptions. The only exemption that still may affect postdocs is if your primary role is teaching. Uh, and I believe this is probably more appropriate towards humanities postdocs. I think even if you were a teaching postdoc um, on something like the Erective program, you're only 25% teaching, so you're still, um, you're still uh, not exempted from this ruling. Key thing also, all international postdocs, and regardless of these status, and regardless of the funding source you're on, if you are working at a US institution as a postdoc, you come under this ruling. Unless you're teaching, you are not exempted from this ruling. So it covers pretty much everyone. Crucially, though, it doesn't cover adjuncts because their primary role is to teach. Um, and continuing on, the, um, I wanted to, to note this because there has been some concern as to whether this will be reversed. Uh, some of these higher ed organizations then did the want to start supporting efforts in uh, Congress to reverse this decision, um, uh, particularly the Protecting Workplace Advancement. Opportunity Act. Uh, my prediction is that nothing will really come of that because first it would have to pass both the House and the Senate, which seems fairly unlikely. It would then have to be signed by President Obama, which is not going to happen. Uh, one person did ask me the other day, could the next president reverse it? Um, and I suppose that's possible, but it seems like that would be an awful lot of work to do. Um, and it'll be interesting to see uh, once everyone's salaries have been raised in December whether then it salaries would be lowered again afterwards. So I think I think this is the situation we're in. I think this is what's going to happen. We are we are going forward with this. <coughs> so what does it mean for postdocs? And the question is, are we raising all the salary or tracking the hours? This is a crucial thing that everyone is wrangling over right now. Um, there's a nice, really uh, really good summary mm -hmm. of this. Both the 
the ASD print plug post as you hear. This really gives a nice succinct summary of also some of the cultural aspects of this that we start, we really shouldn't be tracking your hours because that's not really how this stuff works. Um, but I want to talk about salary and um, sort of the landscape for that, so you can that in context. So what I've taken here, this is a paper that came out from um, a group with the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, Chris Pickett was there at the time, he's now with Rescue Environmental Research, their director. And they came up, they went through a bunch of reports that have come out in the last few years uh, discussing the state of environmental enterprise, and they wanted to find what the consensus points were, what everyone agreed on, and then try and make recommendations, you know, make it a bit more clear. And so one of the recommendations was that institutions and federal agencies should be increasing compensation for COSO. Um, their, their solution, their, their direction was the NIH should increase the pay scale, starting at $50,000 a year. Uh, institutions should conform to that pay scale regardless of the funding source people are on. And this was not really out of nowhere. This came out of the National Academy of Science had um, advocated for this, the American Academy, uh, Rescue Biomedical Research, the uh, working group that actually reported to the NIH on the biomedical workforce, uh, and then on the job, of course. So this was a fairly consensus view. Um, and we are still advocating that the salary should increase again to at least 50,000. Um, we agree with the National Academy of Sciences that there should be 50,000 minimum that should be adjusted annually for inflation and should also be adjusted for regional uh, living costs. And I think the Boston Post Office Association has some good information on what they think the Boston level should be. Uh, this is an infographic we have uh, designed up on our website. Uh, was comparing the different levels. And even in 2000, the National Research Council suggested a salary of just over 55 million dollars. So it's been a long time that people have been suggesting that. It's been fairly, a fairly wide consensus across a lot of levels of that. So we, we think this is a great start with the salaries being raised at 47 and a half thousand, but we think it should keep going. So a lot of focus has gone into this data. This is the, um, the new NRSA levels. These are the, the stipend levels that postdoc salaries are usually approximately pegged to. Um, this is what they currently are at in the blue here. The red is what they're going to be after the uh, change earlier this time. Uh, you will notice that the gradients of the first two years has changed. They decided not to just shift the whole line up, starting at 47,500. But instead, they have a slow gradient and then we go back onto the same kind of track. So there's been a lot of interest about this, this graph. It'll be interesting to see the effects that it has, especially at this point. Um, but if anything, I think there's been a little too much focus on this one because I actually feel the number of people that are affected by this is rather low um, compared to the, the total postdoc population. This is because the only, the only people who really have to conform to this are the NIH themselves for their training mechanisms, what they have to pay. Everyone else sort of pegs themselves to it, but I think you'll find there's a wide distribution of people who are or are not using it, or they suggest it, but whether their postdocs are actually being paid off it. And some of the good data to support this comes from the National Postdoc Association Institutional Policy Report. And this graph shows the minimum stipend that is set at different institutions. You can see the range goes from 23,000 here and is presumably at 23,660 dollars, which is the current FLSA exemption minimum. And it goes right way through to 80,000. Um, you will notice that 51% of institutions set their minimum at the NIH minimum, which is 2013 data. So it's a little lower, the numbers are a little lower. But I predict this is probably about the same now, that most people say this is where their, their minimum should be. You'll notice 11% of the surveyed institutions didn't even have set minimums. Again, presumably they have to be at least signed with federal law on the FLSA. Of those that do have a minimum, 7% do not require it. So they have a minimum, but nobody is enforcing it. Um, and given the nature of the postdoc and how many people are 
put into postdoc positions in a piecemeal kind of fashion. You can imagine, as I've heard many cases, of postdocs who have fallen through the cracks and are like very different salaries compared to what the institution says they should be at. So one of the points I sort of wanted to make here was like, here's the current minimum and here's where this starts. And I think this is very telling. Here is the new minimum. This is fixed, this is the actual number this new minimum will be at. Uh, again, this is assuming that this graph has the same distribution. My prediction would be is it's basically looks the same, but this mid peak is over here. That says it's about 44,000 points uh, close to where the current minimum is. And so, what this means is that when the FLSA comes into effect, if we're going to raise all the postdoc salaries, absolutely everyone in this population here, there is no question they must be at this new salary as well. And I think this is quite, uh, quite an important point to hammer home, is just how many people this will affect. There are literally people whose salaries will double if they are kept on after the FLSA goes into effect, if the institution is raising the salary. Um, and I've just contacted uh, earlier today, I got the email from journal staff coming about the uh, University of California, that even though they have a union and there's a salary minimum, there are postdocs there on salaries in the 30,000 range. Why is that? And it turned out, of course, that they're on fellowships. And so there are all these different kinds of mechanisms, all these different ways that people are being paid. Absolutely everyone at all of these fellowships and all of the visas, if they're working as a postdoc at a U.S. institution and te teaching is not their primary function, they will all be shifted up into this point. This is, a, I think, a very major but uh, underreaching point about this. It's just how many people it will affect. Uh, and it leads to all sorts of questions as to whether those postdocs will actually have their salaries doubled or whether those will be the first people to go. So there's, there's a lot of interesting points to sort of draw out of this. So that's sort of laying out the salary context. Um, I'm going to try to make the case to you of why I think no one will track hours. And the major thing that convinced me um, was watching lawyers talk to uh, people in higher education. Um, <laughs> very revealing. And so I really, um, I would really recommend watching this video uh, by the American School of Education. They have this webinar, um, and uh, they have four people. One here is the lawyer. Um, they have someone from HR and someone who was uh, in the sort of dean uh, administration level. Um, there's a lot of interesting points here. There are two things that I really want to bring out that, that I find key. The first is that the lawyer made very clear that it's a violation of these orders. It's very easy for the employee to win. And this is because the burden of proof is on the institution. So there's a lot of talk about people just making up whatever is on the time sheet. But if the institution cannot prove what people are doing, and does not have the proof themselves, the time sense of what they're doing, postdoc can still come back and say, if I had to do this at this time, they just have to bring that forward. And the lawyer makes it very clear repeatedly that it is very much on the side of the employee that this will happen. And if you think about a postdoc uh, whose duties are very wide ranging, um, it's hard to imagine how you would, you would enforce this. Um, the, the other major thing to me is that postdocs are very much a drop in the ocean to institutions um, uh, because the people who would be tracking the hours are also coming under this regulation and they already have too much to do and this is already a point of concern. Most of the video we will find is taken up uh, talking about people who deal with admissions and they need to be in more certain times of the year and whether that works out. Talking about all these little nitty gritty details about the administrator. And so it seems very clear to me that if I were an institution, I, I would already be worried about getting the work done that needs to be done um, without starting to track doctoral research. So here is sort of a, a, a list of my thoughts on why I think that we will track the hours. So first thing is what the institutions are doing. Um, everyone who has declared what they're doing so far is raising salary. There, and all of, all of the, pretty much 99% of the people who are giving the indications of what they're doing are raising salary. Let's be honest here, if the institution is going to have to take on more people to work on tracking hours, or they're just going to pass the cost on to the PI coming out of the grant, they're going to pass it on to the PI. Like that's, that's very clear, I think. Um, and it's unfortunate for the PI, but it seems like the realistic thing when the legal burden falls on the institution. 
what I find really interesting in this conversation is when there are people who say, my public stuff is going to work 40 hours on my project and the rest in their time. We sort of have this, this culture in parts of academia that, that docs are really in there to, to do the bench science and get on with the labor. And there's sort of a cheap temporary version of staff scientists you have around. Unfortunately, federally they're recognized as employees and trainees. So it doesn't matter how much a PI protests that their person is only supposed to work on their project for 40 hours. Doing experiments, writing the papers, reading the papers, career development activity, these are all part of a uh, postdoc's job description. Um, I put in tweeting here because I quite genuinely think that someone can make a case that doing outreach, um, um, building, you know, the, the job of a postdoc, if you think about it, is really to get a job as a professor. That is the end goal. And they are meant to be in a supportive, mentored environment, getting their independence, uh, developing um, their, that, that independence. And so anything that they can do to try and make themselves more employable and find a position is likely to be viewed as something that is part of the job description. And so really, the idea that, that people will volunteer hours and such is really not, not a thing. And it's, it's interesting, I think, to see how some PIs are talking about this and then how institutions are talking about it. There's very much a disconnect. It's also illegal for people to volunteer hours under the FLSA. It is not allowed. It is. There's a, there's a resource hunger to, to point to me a couple of slides that will also highlight this. Also email. Email is work. Also emailing. Exactly. <laughs> it, uh, it is unclear to me and somebody needs to explain to me how it would work, but I cannot see how a postdoc could be tracked in 40 hours and not have all of their work on a computer in the lab and that lab locked uh, outside of the 40 hours a week, quite truly. And even then, there's still stuff to do outside of that. Um, with the majority of institutions raising salary, which we know already, an institution that's tracking its postdocs is going to put its postdocs at a competitive disadvantage. If you want to work at this place that is tracking your hours, restricting how much you can do when you're competing with people at other institutions, you're able to get more work done. The PIs are going to be at a disadvantage because their hours are going to be restricted again and how much they can get done. Um, and again, this is ignoring the, the idea of volunteering time. It will truly put people at a disadvantage, and it will put the institution at a disadvantage. Again, for these kinds of reasons, postdocs and PIs don't want to come, and they'll get fewer grants, they'll be less productive. Institutions that do so will also be under severe scrutiny in the current climate. I think it's very interesting that the Department of Labor, um, uh, you know, the, the blog post with Francis Collins and Thomas Perez, um, and other rhetoric that you see in the administration, some of the things that Joe Biden was talking about with the Spencer Moonshot, uh, the interest that some people in Congress have in postdoc term limits, I'm not joking. So it's um, it's very interesting, and a lot of people, including us, but a lot of other groups too, will be monitoring those institutions that are doing this. You don't have to take my word for it, I'm just, you know, this guy who wandered off the street. The, Boston Postdoc Association, they have a whole bunch of resources, and these are a couple of my favorites here, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, ACE video that I mentioned before. The 10 common assumptions with the FLSA, pretty much anyone who starts to talk about volunteering, volunteering hours or any of these other things should read this first. Um, and then, again, another video that's sort of just telling you how to prepare and what you should know. And it's been very instructive. That has been the most instructive part for me, seeing what the lawyers say. Um, it's quite surprising. I have been surprised too. Uh, these are some of the institutions that, um, not an exhaustive list, <laughs> these are just some of the ones that we know of so far. Um, so most are, are seem to be taking the position of just going with that, that level, um, 47,076. Dana-Farber actually had already started on a $50,000 salary and the uh, postdocs there have been advocating for that for a long time. And that's, it's actually been a separate thing that went through. Stanford last year started off at 50000 um, from October 1st and this year it goes up to 51600 Our tracking institution. So I have heard a lot of hearsay and rumor and lots of people that say, oh, such and such a case is going to be doing it and some other place might be thinking of doing it. I have seen a data set where institutions have been anonymously surveyed, and 
all of them except one said they were raising salary and one said they were planning to track salary. So as yet, and as, that, that was a little while ago, and it's unclear whether they could that decision, it's just what they were planning. So as yet, all the ones that have declared are raising salaries, all the ones except one that are thinking about what to do and have declared are basically raising salaries. Uh, we did have this one um, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, their website had a, a, a little part that said um, postdocs who are not above a certain level or not exempt from the threshold can change to hourly pay status and be eligible for overtime payments. Timesheets will be required. Um, we sort of brought this up on Twitter and started discussing it, and they were involved in the conversation and they issued a clarification to us to say, oh, this was published in May. It really just sort of conformed with what's new. Um, I think it was interesting that they, they bothered to write the timesheets in. I would have just put, you know, we're looking into this and we'll change as it goes on. But it looks like they're, you know, they're still thinking about it. So they have not declared as yet that they are tracking time. So as yet, I'm yet to hear of anyone definitely that's doing it. Um, one of the, the things that gets thrown at me a lot is, have we talked to a medical resident? They, they don't necessarily report their hours. Um, I'm married to one, and occasionally, <laughs> occasionally I see him that he's not in the hospital. And we talked about this, and it was very interesting. Um, the first sort of key technical point that's a little bit niggling, but I think can be important, is that medical residents are exempt from the FLSA. So it's actually a different reporting system. Um, and FLSA violations, you go to the Department of Labor first. You don't think you have to go to your institution. You can if you want, but you are able to go straight to the Department of Labor. The idea of having skin in the game, and if you're up to a quarter of a million dollars in debt from your medical school tuition, uh, as well as your undergraduate tuition, um, you can imagine you might have a slightly different perspective on whether or not you're going to support your program versus someone who came to grad school, still has debt, but you know, grad students haven't paid for a while. So perhaps there's a little bit, the skin in the game, it, I put it in very common sense, that gets brought up a lot of discussions that graduate students should have more skin in the game. And discussions about charging graduate students for tuition, which I am against. But this is, you know, a key difference between the two populations. Job certainty. So the medical residents are a lot like the postdocs of the medical system. But what's interesting is that the bottleneck in that system generally seems to be getting from med school into a residency. That is the point of most competition. Once you're in a residency, you are relatively well set up to get a job. You're sort of on the downhill slope. Uh, you know, there's variation in the field, of course, and exceptions. But certainly compared generally to the postdoc population, you are far more guaranteed a job than you are in the postdoc, particularly if you're uh, looking for an academic job. So the odds are ever more in your favor, and so perhaps you may be likely to be a big buyer. Uh, this is a really interesting point, too, that actually if you're in a medical residency program, you, there's a perception that you might harm your training and the training of others because reporting the program might get in trouble, it might lead to your resources. Um, what's interesting, I, I spoke at uh, Harvard the other day to a uh, postdoc, there were about 100 in the room, and I asked them how many of you uh, postdocs are getting training or have received training on financial management or running a lab financially. Nobody put their hand up. I said, how many of you have received training on personnel management and human resources and how to manage people in a lab? Nobody put their hand up. I said, how many of you spend most of your time at the bench? And everyone put their hand up. And so the, the training, this is not even a, a point really, a lot of postdocs do not receive training, it's already a, a contentious point, um, that we're not being trained for the positions we're supposed to be heading for. And so that argument falls down there. And that sort of ties in with the burning of bridges. If you're a medical resident, you're probably likely to go on to be a doctor in the same field as the people you trained with. You will likely keep in touch with the program, as you probably have an interest in not, um, not destroying that relationship or, or damaging it. If you are a postdoc and you have less chance of getting an academic position and you end up leaving academia entirely, the question is, what incentive do you not have to destroy that relationship if you feel that it is in bad? In particular, if I take you on to how to report, there's a three year statute of limitations. So within three, within three years of having left your postdoc, you could report violations. Um, and so 
there seems to be a lot of faith in some academic circles that this stuff simply would not report. I cannot be with all of these things together that at least, and it only will take one postdoc, that a postdoc in an institution would not report as an hours tracking institution any violation. So it is going to be an extremely tough legal situation for institutions to make sure they're compliant and to make sure that, that everything works out. It seems too much work for me uh, doing it from that perspective. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether institutions could be on that route. Uh, again, the reporting is completely confidential until the point of the allegation being pursued. You can talk with people at the Department of Labor and they will um, they will discuss with you whether or not you have a case and if you'll move forward then no one needs to know anything. But if they think there's a strong enough case to move forward and someone to be investigated, then that's when the anonymity would break. Um, so you deal with the Department of Labor, you don't go through the institution, which I think is different than some of these other uh, situations that people suggest uh, where people don't report violations. Um, it is illegal for employers to take action against employees based on this reporting. And interestingly, they will not, they will sort of leave any immigration questions uh, at the side um, if people are not on the right visas or whether they come into an institution and people are not on the right visas. Um, that will, this sort of is a point that comes up that probably is more relevant to the case of whether undocumented workers, but still, immigration status is not going to be a factor in this if you're worried about your immigration status. So, so the, one of the things I sort of want to think about or, or leave, and I have no answers to any of these, I have some vague ideas, but there are so many questions that come up here. Um, how will this affect smaller institutions? It seems likely that smaller institutions are going to suffer more than the larger ones. Um, some of the larger institutions that are going forward are setting up things like a pot of money in the institution that, with which you can supplement your postdoc salary on top of what you have been paying them to catch up. And then after five years, that pot will disappear and you have to be making up. And it gives the sort of intra institutional uh, transition time. Um, but smaller institutions may not be able to do that. Um, and May, may already be struggling in, in supporting postdocs. Is there going to be a dip in the new hires because they're so much more expensive? Um, but also with that, the shift in the gradients, are there going to be fewer postdocs say on the past two years because it's cheaper to get rid of them and then just start again with the gradients start to shift? Um, I have no idea. Will junior faculty bear the brunt of this? Will they be the ones who are facing the most costs? Will the costs sort of be uh, below the greatest of the bottom end of the, the faculty system. Will the tenure professors who perhaps might have less pressure to try and get things out and have a tenure position, will they be the most likely to cut their postdoc route? It's hard to know whether if you're in a small lab or if you're in a big lab in a place uh, that is, is raising the salary, whether but it, it is unclear to me which, which is the, the risky situation. There's often an argument when you're talking about these that someone has to be doing the work, someone needs to be doing the best time. So is this going to lead to, if there is a decrease in the postdoc population, are we going to see a sharper increase in an already accelerating um, PhD population? What is interesting too is that because there is money in the NRSA pot, um, the NIH pots and the fellowship pots, are there going to be more, more postdocs on those rather than research grants? Again, are we going to see more grad students who paid off research grants um, and a shift that way? Are postdocs, is there going to be a decrease in the number of postdocs and are a greater percentage of them going to be offering that? That would be interesting to see. Um, one sort of interesting point here, I sort of laid out that for years we've been talking about raising postdoc salary. And there's now a lot of complaint that there's not a lot of time to do things and we're having to respond to this change. And you know, the question is here, if we'd started doing this before and taking some action, could we have could we have created a system and figured things out ourselves to do this? We're now reacting to an external change over which there is no control. Um, and it's interesting again, I think the attitudes that are coming up of my postdoc will be 40 hours and this kind of thing sort of is a complete misunderstanding of how federal labor law works. And because it's not there's a perception that academia usually gets around and there, there is no way around a lot of this. Um, so it, it would be really interesting to see if we can start being more proactive on things rather than having to react to these issues. Um, 
pure process is an issue that comes up a lot. That sometimes has a concern. I personally think that pure postdocs is a good thing. I think we have too many already. Um, and there is this sort of ever expanding pool of postdocs. 30% um, do one month postdoc. This is actually uh, from 2012 data. So this population has expanded, this population has expanded. This population, which is non tenure track positions and just these adjuncts, have expanded. The current tenured and tenure track faculty is stationary, perhaps a little smaller. Um, and so we we have sort of ever expanding pool of postdocs, and I think there, there's a lot of a lot of questions to be answered about what a postdoc is and what they should be. Are they really going to be? Are they going to be doing bench science the way they are now, or should we really be refocusing and setting up a population that is being trained for academia? And trained, I mean being trained, not just directed to, but actually being trained for it. So that sort of ties in with this effort um, I mentioned before with ASCMB that we're trying to harmonize postdoc titles. And there's a lot of institutions that have actually done it, have ways of, of tracking their postdocs. Um, there's 37 different names for postdocs that uh, this is a word cloud of, of all of them generated from the NPA data. Um, and I believe there, somebody from the National Cancer Institute mentioned that they had 49 different ways. Um, a lot of which included like Pythons and Spaces and that kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's a complete mess when there's all these different titles. And we don't know how many postdocs there are in the system within a factor of two, maybe 40 to 80,000. That's sort of the number that it's thrown out. Um, people sort of fall through the cracks in terms of getting benefits, in terms of getting uh, the same salaries as other postdocs. Um, one particularly crazy situation is that if you apply for a fellowship, sometimes you lose your benefit, benefits when you get onto that fellowship, um, which makes you wonder why someone would apply for a competitive fellowship only to then actually lose out. Um, so we're trying to coordinate this effort. I mean, we were doing, trying to set this up before all of the FLA, FLSA stuff happened. Um, and the idea is to provide institutions with a plan. Some places have done it already and have done it well, and so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to spread this out. Um, it's also a great carrot so we'll be able to track postdocs better, the data will be better, you'll be able to make their benefits better, salaries, but there's now this walking great stick of you have to make sure that you're complying with federal labor law and you know who all your postdocs are. Um, and so I'm really keen to sort of get postdocs involved in this too in terms of other institutions making sure this is happening, making sure they know um, what is happening with the FLSA and stuff. I think there's a lot of misinformation and uh, things are unclear. And a lot of institutions, I think, are going ahead with changes and have not been consulting postdoc associations or postdoc offices that are sort of administering things in the background um, and forgetting some of the things that are, uh, are needed to postdoc. Post so this is an effort going on now, and we hope to have a white paper out at the end of September, or a draft ready at the end of September. Sorry, too. Um, but obviously to have these things ready in time for the December 1st change over so that people can implement it uh, or, or get working on it. I think everyone wins. And wins the so I just want to say thanks. Um, thanks to all of you for coming along and for Tufts Postdoc Association for hosting me. Uh, I'm funded by the Philanthropy Project. Um, I'm also uh, have a residence space in the Penny Lab in Science Space. San Francisco, which is funded by Gordon Bell and Foundation, uh, just started a CCI a grant for the NFF, then ASCMB together on the Postdoc designation team. So I'll say thank you and we'll take any questions. Oh, that was nice.